On the agenda tonight, I'm going to be talking all things music and all things Prince with Morris Hayes, who played with Prince for the best part of 20 years. Hello, Phil here from Wings of Pegasus and welcome to a very special video. If you do enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. But earlier this week, I had the distinct pleasure of talking with Morris, so we will jump straight into the interview. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Hayes, can you hear me? How you doing, brother? I'm good, how are you? I can't complain, bro, everything's good. Thank you for joining me on the channel, uh, first of all. But maybe we could start with kind of your story and, and you know, maybe even as far back as when you started playing yourself and your progression up to then uh, making it a full-time career and then working with Prince. Yeah, I, it, really, brother, it's... Uh, first of all, thank you for having me uh, on your show. I've, I've watched you on the internet and uh, I've seen a lot of cats, you know, on, on the internet talking about Prince and talking about Prince's music and all of that sort of thing. And uh, I have to say, bro, you, you are one of the dopest cats that I've seen uh, that would uh, that could just watch what he did and really mimic and really not even mimic, but just play what he played. And, and I, I saw your channel and I was like, wow, I've seen a lot of these. But that was impressive. I said the tonality, the the approach, like everything was spot on, you know. And I was like, I was impressed, man, because it's a, it's a lot of people that can kind of like, you know, kind of get around the edges. But it's very few that can just hit it like dead on the nail, uh, the nail on the head like that, man. And I was just really impressed. So it's great to talk to you. Uh, and I just say that. But my, my story, man, is really uh, it's really the hero's journey kind of story, man. I'm from a this little small town that I'm back in now. I'm back. I started in terms of uh, growing up in a small town, and and uh, you know, I just kind of music was just kind of a thing that was just around. I, I went to church and I played a little bit at church. And, you know, not really great, uh, but you know, just doing my thing at church. You know, and I just uh, my brother was a DJ. You know, we used to he used to do house parties and stuff like this, and and so I just got exposed to a lot of the records he would play. The cool thing is uh, about my musical background is living in the woods, living out here where there's not a really good signal from the nearest city. The stations that came in really good were the FM stations that were like the pop and the rock stations and everything. And so I ended up listening to a lot of rock and roll because I liked the way that it sounded when I put my headphones on. And I would I'd like put my heads on and I'd just be grooving and grooving. And, 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 I, and so, of course, they played crossover R&B type stuff like Stevie Wonder or sometimes Earth, Wind & Fire, different things. But I ended up listening to a lot of, uh, you know, Steely Dan and and uh, a lot of rock and roll stuff like uh, just like uh, uh, Asia and uh, Boston, all kind of stuff like this, man, that I was listening to, you know. And um, I just it was cool because I just sonically it appealed to me. I didn't know why at the time. It's like having a superpower that you don't know that you have. You just know that you have this knack for something and you can't really explain it. And then it just later on, it starts to develop and you realize that's an ear you have. So I don't, I don't have any like a uh, formal training, I just hear. And so uh, uh, that just kind of was the start of it. And then when I got into college, I just skipped forward to college because that's where it really picked up. I got uh, one of these college bands playing keyboards and, uh, and uh, we had a, another guy that was playing keys that was really, really great. And so I just was kind of like there, just like for the, you know, for the girls, and just like, yeah, I'm in the band, you know. And it and, and until he stopped playing is when it got serious. And I was like, okay, they're like, we got a Bill Clinton thing. We're doing a fundraiser for for Bill Clinton's running for governor at the time, and we had to play this function. They said you got to learn those parts because now it's on you. And that's when it really the rubber hit the road, brother. And, and I was like, wow, I got to really play this stuff and 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 do this and. And I pulled, we pulled the gig off, I pulled it off, and that kind of set a different kind of a vibe for me at that point. It was like, it, it turned to like the musical side of things and, and how that feeling of just being able to accomplish something like that. And, and, and then that's what really set the musical thing off in motion, man. And so that was kind of like the beginning of it. 
And then, uh, you know, I trek to a different places. I end up getting with a gospel group that toured over the country in a car with all our instrumentations in this trunk. And then I, I moved to Chicago. And that was the real big break for me. I planted this this really big mega kind of church at that time. Mega church, not like these churches are now, but but big enough that they were on television nationwide. And they had a lot of uh, five, by the time I think about 5,000 members. And so it was like, that was the big time for me. And um, and I got a call from my college buddy that I was in a band with that were, they were living in Memphis. And they called and said, hey, man, we got a possible deal with Motown. We got a showcase. We got this, this thing. We want you to come down and do this show at this club. And and so, man, I had to like make a decision, go down there and, um, and, and do this thing. But while I was in college, one really important thing happened. Uh, Prince came to town. He came to my little town, Pine Bluff, Arkansas. He only came one time in his career. And um, this was December 7, 1982. And uh, his group came and my whole band went to the concert. And I saw the show and it was uh, Vanity Six, Worst Day in the Time in Prince. And I remember being like far back in the, in the venue and, and thinking, um, man, Morris Day and them are amazing. These girls came out, the band was behind the curtain, playing behind the curtain, and you couldn't see them, but they were killing it, right? Three girls in front and the band's in the back. They kill it, Morris Day comes out. I said, oh my God, these guys are great. I wanna play with them. Prince comes out, like, oh my God, he's great. I'm gonna play with him too, you know? And, and I left that theater, uh, that venue, and I th that was like my goal now. This is like my, my destiny. All roads leads to Minneapolis. And so it was a 10-year journey, and 19, that was 1982. By 1992, I was in the band at the end of the year. So, and I went with Carmen Electra to, uh, to on the Diamonds and Pearls tour. And there's a bunch of stuff in between. Of course, this is the Cliff Notes version, but that was the long and short of it. And, and when I got into uh, Carmen's band, and uh, Prince kind of saw me doing some stuff around Paisley Park, I used to work at the studio as basically a gopher. I would drive the band. I, do whatever they needed me to do. I had a walkie-talkie and all this. And then I got a big break uh, when they let me play on one of the Times records. Uh, one of the Prince's producers, Levi Caesar, was working on a record for the film uh, Graffiti Bridge. And they let me play on a track, and a couple of tracks. And, um, and that's what got me noticed by the record label people and then Prince eventually. And so uh, once I got in the, on the tour, Carmen would tell me and my would tell me a dancer would tell me Chris likes you. He thinks you're funny. He really digs you. You know, he likes you playing. And I'm like, get out of town, man. He's, he's got Barbarella. He's got Rosie. He's got two of the killers, you know. And uh, and sure enough, at the end of that tour, Rosie had quit, and and he just uh, I ran into him in a nightclub, at his club, and he said, hey grandson, you need some work, want a job? And I said, yo yeah, I'll be over there to cut that yard for you first thing Monday. And he did. We had a big laugh, and then he says, no nah, man, I want you to be in the band. And that was bro. That was the beginning of the uh, of the whole situation, and it was been a phenomenal ride, bro. When you're you know with Prince, and you know obviously an amazing time. Given that Prince was such an all round artist, but being a multi instrumentalist, when he had uh, parts that you know he he would have played on keys, how much was mm -hmm. there from him of right, this is what I played and you're going to play it exactly the same or here are the kind of outlines of what I want and, you know, for you to put in a certain feel or you know, a groove yourself into what you're playing. When I first started, um, Prince was like, I mean, bro, he was on MTV every day. He's, he's on, you know, it's, he's Prince, Prince. And so it's like, you know, there's a lot of people at Paisley Park. There's folks all over the place. And so I came into it. It was it was hot and heavy, you know what I'm saying? And so um, there was a lot of people and a lot of folks running stuff and doing stuff. So a lot of the music was like the record. He wanted stuff to sound like the record, you know. But the, the double-edged sword to Prince was that he was very impatient. So uh, sometimes, you know, getting a lot of those things took time, which was not something that he was very... Uh, very good with in terms of uh, he wants to go, 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 do, do, do right now. So all of this stuff, you got to go down into the vault and pull out some stuff. You know, I remember when I came, I'm a geek, man. So I, I, I'm into like equipment and gear and that sort of stuff. And, and I just noticed 
uh, when I came into Prince, you know, his situation, because he would come to my rehearsal with Carmen and, and he'd be like amazed. He'd be like, you know, cause I got two keyboards, man. His cats had like racks, like a refrigerator rack and stuff like I got over here. So it's like, it looked like this for like his under the stage situation. And I had just two keyboards, you know, and maybe another thing for samples and stuff like this. And so I had just these units and he's like, how are you getting all of this sound out of just two keyboards? Like, that's just crazy. You know, and the, and the chords I would play, you know, like churchy chords, these real fat chords. And, and um, you know, that was interesting to him, like how I was doing that. He actually asked me to come and program for his keyboard player. And, uh, and a manager friend, my, my, my uh, I call him my sage, Craig Rice, he was like, um, he's like, no, don't go do that. He said, don't go and program for him. He'll kind of, you know, Prince will lock you into that's what you do. And that's kind of what your thing is. And he'll kind of see you that way. And I said, he said, I want you to see you like a keyboard player. So I didn't go do that. But when he, when he ended up getting me, I told him, I said, hey, Prince, I said, uh, no disrespect. I said, but your gear sucked. Like, I got better equipment than you and your Prince, bro. Like, you should, you know, you should have better stuff than me. So he said, well, fix it. And so I went to his guy, his production manager, and said, hey, Prince said, fix these crappy keyboards. And, uh, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, his sampler was like this. And I, and, I, and, I, and I like these guys. Emu made some cool stuff back in the day, but their sampler sample at like 39.7 or some weird sample rate like this. And I was like, we had to convert. I had these samplers. I had a, like at the time, this Roland uh, S750. Uh, and, and these things were like bananas, you know? And so I'm like, they're sampling. They're, they're, they're like high end. They're like, you know, a lot of money for these things. One of them was like eight grand for this sampler. I had one of those. And, um, and so I said, yeah, man, you need to update your stuff. My stuff will do infinitely more than this. And, 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 and when he saw what he could do, his, like the lights came on and just like, like, oh, yeah. Well, if you can do this, then you can do this and this and that and this and that and this and this and this. I really made a lot of trouble for myself because I, I had no clue that this man would be like into the future like he was. Like he maxed out the technology that I thought was like, you know, he saw that this is light years ahead of what I'm doing, but still I wanted to do more. And so that was always a thing that I came to realize, man. And so it was tough because every day was a challenge. Like, like, okay, so if you could do that, go down and get the Claire Fisher string arrangements and load that up and then go get the this and load that up and, and double my guitar part, load that up. And it was just like, we played in real time, like Claire strings and this sort of stuff because he loved the sound and the lushness of Claire string arrangements. And so I had like a sampler, I had three samplers that were cross loading because, and hard drives that was like this massive rig that were doing these things that were like, it had to work because we play songs back to back to back. And there's no wait time. It's not like Prince like plays a song and stops and talks and then everything runs into each other, man. It has to be seamless. And so I had to like program this stuff using a program called Opcode. Like Opcode, uh, we used to have this thing in Studio Fives that would MIDI all of those instruments together. So when I push one button, 10 keyboards change patches at the same time and the samplers load at the same time and load the next song. So I just had to beg Prince, like Prince, I need a set list. I know you like to fly by the seat. I need a set list. If these have to preload samples to the next song. There is no sequences running. We would have a four eight bar drum loop for time that the drummer would play from the record so that it sounded like the record. And then we would play loosely. So if Prince decided he didn't want to come in on the first, you know, after the first verse, he just sometimes said, I'm gonna play a solo right here. Just start burning on guitar. And you just had to just keep playing until he said first verse. Then that's where the song starts. You can't do that with like, well, maybe you can with some of the tech they have now, but that just wasn't a thing you could do back then. There was no Pro Tools. There was nothing like digital performer, like which I use to, to, for my shows and stuff. There was none of that. You had to just like play the loop. And, 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 and a short story on that one. He came to my rehearsal and saw me doing that. I actually had, we were playing two, two Prince songs in our club situation. We were playing at Prince's nightclub as the house band. And he came to rehearsal and we were playing two of his songs that I put loops under and blew his mind. They were like, it was a, a European group called, I think TKA, Information Society. Uh, I had a loop from them and put that under 17 days and he, he freaked out. He was like, 
And then he went back to his guys and said, stop the presses. Morris is over there playing loops under our songs. We got to do that, you know? And he did it that way for the rest of his career, man. And that's, I, I, that's the only thing I can say, yes, I ushered that in and, and, and that I feel good about. But that's one of the things that he ended up doing. And, and it just blew his mind to hear like that loop under there. And then he said, that's what, what makes it sound like the record and just gives it that, that authentic sound. Because Prince told me about like on some songs, like a, a Question of You, how he took a basketball and uh, he said, the, the kick drum is a basketball that's bounced and they recorded it. <laughs> and that's a basketball bouncing on the floor. And, and you know, how are you gonna do that other than like, you take that sample, you put it on the drum triggers. And so now when our drummer plays the kick drum, that basketball sample hits on that. And all the other drums have the same samples. And then the drum loop that's underneath that plays. And then that also gives me tempo. So that in my string arrangements, as long as I hit it on the one or, or before the one or after, wherever it was going to fall, then I'd hit that and I know what my tempo, what everything was going to be right. And we got so good at it after so much time, we rehearsed day in and day out. And that was just kind of our regimen. And then we would just have this sound that was incredible because it was just like going to McDonald's every day to work. We punched the clock, we rehearsed whether Prince was there or not. And then it was just perfection, man. I mean, as close to perfection as you can get. And we just had killer musicians, man. So it was a lot of technology working and a lot of things like that. But thinking about, yeah, back in the day of how you would achieve what people, I think, would take for granted now is, oh, oh it's really easy. Just, you know, we'll, we'll do it to a backing track, use a click track with the drum, it'll be fine. Yeah. But it, it must have been, yeah, it obviously had to be something that you absolutely have it down perfectly. And you're also relying on technology you know to a certain extent that it is going to behave exactly as you want it to with every single performance yeah. did you ever have any kind of technical issues with it oh my god yes sir. <laughs> yes sir. and and usually when it happened it was catastrophic i mean sometimes uh, the good thing is the great thing is is that uh what you learn quickly when it comes to technology is you better damn well be able to play the song if your stuff goes down that's the that's the thing. Mm -hmm. You had to know your music, man. At the end of the day, technology is technology. We had certain times when the power went off, but we could still play as long as we had acoustic. We the drummer could play without the drum loop. The, you know, Prince, if he had an acoustic, he could play. If we had a piano, we could play. You know, nobody was gonna. And we did that a few times because some. I remember the power went out in some situation, and we just kept the groove because Prince is from the old school. He was like, the show must go on, bro. You know, I had a keyboard. I used to use these really incredible uh, Nico, the, these uh, Open Labs Nikos. And what they basically were was a virtual instrument player, the com computer with a keyboard wrapped around it. And this thing was incredible because it just took away 15 keyboards that I used to have under the stage and made it so that I could use contact as a sampler rather than a hardware piece. And one day I we were, was at the gig, and unfortunately, this was before the age of solid state hard drives. And, and, and some of the local people had mishandled the keyboard and I saw them drop it. And so you're working with a hard drive on these things. They're sensitive. They dropped the keyboard that was in the case. Like, you know, they're moving stuff. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. You can't drop that like that. That's got to, you know, sure enough, we get to the first set. Everything works. We were doing a two set show. Until about the second song, the, 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 the computer freezes, like the hard drive freezes. It is dead. It is like not the touch screen's not working, nothing's working. Prince notices, you know, that, okay, something's missing. And uh, thank God, man, it, we, it was a quick show to New York. We did a thing at New York and we were gonna just be in and out. And it, they were like, hey, can we not take the spare because, you know, we, we wanna cut down on cargo and just not have all of this stuff to manage. And I'm like, no, we take the spare. Thank God, man, because in the middle of that song, I changed out from that, that computer to the spare in the middle and I remember Anderson Cooper from CNN was there standing right behind me and uh, after the show he told me he says dude I've never seen that before you were playing in the middle of a song and they changed your keyboard out and nothing you didn't miss anything like everybody kept playing like your stuff went off and, you, they, and I said bro that's that's what we have to do Prince knew the loop going before the next song I had to load something up and extended the groove just so that we just kept playing while they unplugged everything put all the wires back in 
I booted up. Now, I didn't have the current set list. I just had to kind of freestyle it from that point. But it was close to what it was last time because Prince changed the show every night. So I was able to get through, man, and just switch it on the fly and do that. So, yeah, we had technical issues that would happen. You know, and, and there was points in the show where, the, where I had really long load times, like the 760 samplers took about 30 seconds to load a full bank, 30 seconds. And, and I would have Barbarella play an intro. That intro was about 20 seconds. And, and I had to load at the last note, hit my button, and then pray that everything comes in because the immediately, the moment it stops loading is when I have to hit the sample to the next intro on the next song. And it just would be like sweat, 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 and sweat it loaded. You can see the bar going by, like, go. And then just like bow, just hit it. And just every day is just like, God, I hope it works. And um, it was it was amazing when it worked. It sucked when it didn't. I, I remember, uh, you know, I had this these samples for this one song he had called Three Chains of Gold. It's like this big opus, kind of like Queen, you know, it's like Bohemian Rhapsody. It's like that vibe. And, and there was these incredible samples at the end with these vocals. And all of this stuff. And Prince changed the, the he changed the arrangement in sound check. I said, we're going to play it like this. Like, I don't care what we learn. We're going to change the whole song. We're going to do this. And here's your new part, Morris. Okay, got it, got it. Moving on. And, and it's like, okay. Okay, we've been doing it this way. I got this new part. It's on the other end of the keyboard. I got this down here. I'm thinking all this like right beforehand, you know? And um, so I'm concentrating so hard on the new part that I just got in sound check. I said, okay, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. I do the new part, nails it. And then I'm like, oh, oh, and then I just forgot, like I got to hit the other samples at the end. And bro, I just hit a handful of stuff. Bleed <laughs> off. And the next day in the next city was the, was the moment of reckoning when you have the you know, princes out in the audience somewhere. You can't see him. And, and you just hear the voice of God come on the PA system, Morris. And you don't see him. He's just, he could be anywhere. And he says, um, what happened last night? And I said, yeah, Prince, I was, I was thinking about that new part, man, that I just got in. And I forgot about the samples on the other end. And I just, yeah, he says, uh, yeah, he said, I just wanted to go home. He said, don't ever do that again. <laughs> like, it's like, oh, my God. So it was like sometimes where it was stuff like that, man. And it, that was this would be, like I said, catastrophic. It was like crazy. And because Prince had moves for everything. He put his arms out like Dinah Ross. Then the thunderstorm and whatever the sample is for that. It has to hit. That is a cue. That is a part in the song that has to happen. Or else he's like standing out there like you hear crickets and there's nothing. There's no action in it. No, as Prince would say, Morris, there's no fruit bared. There's nothing there. I, I'm, I'm out here like Diana Ross and the fan's blowing. My hair's looking great and I have no sound. And, you know, and that was really a thing for him, man. We just had so many things to remember. But it, like I said, we had some, some bad moments, but the majority, the great majority, well, it was fantastic fantastic just memorable things even saying now about artists relying on technology rather than it being something that is adding to their sound it's like embellishing their sound mm -hmm. that was already good and the way that i uh, talk yeah. to people on my channel about playing guitar i always say that if you can sound great on a, a clean tone everything else is going to be a bonus like if you if you use distortion yeah. and delay and, and reverb it's yeah. going to embellish your sound but if you're relying on that Absolutely. and then you drop your distortion pedal and you sound awful on a clean tone, yeah, there's nothing you can do. So, yeah, I think right. it's an important that is, takeaway. That is, that is fantastic. And that is so, Prince would say the same thing. And that's, that's a practice that, you know, we had to be able to. I mean, the, I think the key word here, man, is, is, is balance. You know, is balance. It's, it's not letting the, take, the technology take over your whole thing and render your show useless uh, if it doesn't work and if there's an issue. 
you know, we had to be ready to just like go to it, you know. I'm just going to jump in here because Morris and I did talk for quite a long time. So it means it's going to run the course of more than one video. So this is the end of part one. And make sure that you are subscribed and hit that notification bell so that you do get notified for part two of the interview. Again, a huge thank you to Morris for joining me. And I'll catch you guys at part two. Rock!